The Eternals ending and post credit scenes explain. After 7,000 years and a couple of shifting release dates, Marvel's Eternals is finally here to regale mankind with tales of their daring do, their daring don't, and things they dared not do until those pesky deviants reared their ugly heads once more. Based on the delightfully bonkers Jack Kirby characters, Eternals is one of Marvel's most ambitious movies to date, packing in a metric ton of lore and setting tons of storylines in motion over its prodigious runtime. But what it seems like everyone's been talking about and many people have been asking us about are the implications of the film's ending and its two post credit scenes. Now we're gonna break everything down for you, including any Easter eggs or hidden details that you might have missed in just a moment. If you prefer to read all about it, Rosie Knight has you covered over on Nerdist.com. But to talk about this stuff, obviously we need to spoil what happens in Eternals. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, make like Makari and run away as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> All right, let's get into it, shall we? After an epic showdown on a volcanic island in the Indian Ocean, some unexpected betrayals, and Crow, the power-glurping evolving deviant doing his best impression of that laser hallway scene from the first Resident Evil movie, our heroes managed to form a brainstorm, excuse me, a unimind, linking their powers to amplify Cersei's matter manipulation ability so they can turn Tiamat into marble before the nascent celestial can do to planet Earth what we thought Ant-Man was going to do to Thanos' butt. A forlorn Icarus flies too close to the sun, proving that myths are based in reality after all. Cersei uses the last vestiges of cosmic energy that she absorbed from Tiamat to turn Sprite into a human, and life largely returns to normal. Well, as normal as things can be for near-immortal godlike beings who just discovered their entire existence is a lie. Thena, Druig, and Makari eventually depart for outer space on a newly repaired Domo in search of other Eternals on other worlds, while Fastos, Kingo, Cersei, and Sprite remain on Earth. While Fastos spends time with his family and Kingo ferries Sprite off to school in his purple car with Kingo vanity plates, Cersei goes for a walk in the park with Dane Whitman, who's wearing the Disney-bounding version of his Black Knight costume from the comics. Dane is just about to spill the beans about his family's hidden legacy when all of a sudden Cersei freezes up. She's placed into a stasis of sorts by Arishem, the towering red celestial who we saw through much of the movie. Now suffice to say, he isn't exactly thrilled the Eternals went off book, sacrificing Tiamat to preserve the people of Earth. Taking Kingo, Fastos, and Cersei into space, Arishem declares their memories will determine whether or not mankind is truly worth saving. Arishem promises to return for judgment before vanishing with all three remaining Earthbound Eternals. This is teasing something in the comics known as Celestial Hosts, which are events where the Celestials visit planets to perform experiments on their inhabitants and or pass judgment on whether said planets are worthy of preservation or if they should be destroyed and harvested for their energy. As depicted in Thor number 300, the fourth Celestial Host returned to Earth to deem whether or not the human experiment was a success or a failure. So let's just say that when giant space gods show up on your doorstep to decide the fate of your planet, it's usually bad news bears, even when it works out. Now, whether or not we actually get an Eternals remains to be seen, but the implications of where the Eternals have been taken by Arishem and the impending Celestial Host coming to Earth will invariably play out in future entries in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And we have even more clues about the future of the MCU thanks to those incredible post credit scenes as well. The first one finds Thena, Makari, and Druig traveling through space on the Domo on their mission to find more Eternals on other worlds and wake them up to the truth of their reality. Wake up, undying sheeple! your robots. They haven't heard from Cersei, Fastos, or Kingo in weeks, and they're getting a little more than concerned. However, before they can decide what to do next, they're interrupted by a diminutive drunkard voiced by Patton Oswalt, and of course I'm talking about Pip the Troll. Hailing from the planet Laxadaisia, Pip was an alien prince who loved to paint until one day he transformed into a satyr-like troll after drinking a hallucinogenic ale with a mutagenic side effect. Created by Thanos creator Jim Starlin, Pip first appeared in 1975's Strange Tales 179. Pip is usually depicted as a gruff, no-nonsense character who's always chomping on a cigar, which is fitting because Pip was modeled after Eternals creator Jack Kirby, also rarely seen without a stogie himself. And while Pip is perhaps best known for palling around with Adam Warlock, who Will Poulter will play in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, in Eternals, Pip's actually here to welcome an even hornier space god to the MCU, Eros, as played by Harry Styles. In his litany of accolades before Eros walks through the door, Pip drops a ton of comic book references in short order. He calls Eros the Royal Prince of Titan, the Brother of Thanos, the Knave of Hearts, the Defeater of Black Roger, and Star Fox all before this regal redhead makes his MCU debut. Also created by Jim Starlin alongside Mike Friedrich, Mike Esposito, and John Costanza, Eros first appeared in 1973's Iron Man number 55. 
Eros is basically the polar opposite of his power-hungry brother Thanos. He's a carefree pleasure seeker who prefers the finer things in life. And while he possesses many of the baseline superhuman abilities that Eternals do, he's also able to stimulate the pleasure centers of people's brains in close proximity to him, a power guaranteed to turn that frown upside down and launch some wildly irresponsible fan fiction. Now some other quick Eros facts for you, he helped the Avengers defeat Thanos in the comics. Black Roger, or Dark Roger as he's also known, was the king of a place called Mystery Planet who battled Eros and a werewolf singer named Howlin' Wolf and a space nightclub called the Caverns of Silence. You know, because comics. Anyway, the Knave of Hearts was an alter ego that Eros went by after being kidnapped by the sorceress Morgan Le Fay, who used magic to transform him into her own personal guard. As for Star Fox, well, that's not because he's an expert at barrel rolls. Rather, the name was given to him when he joined the Avengers because they thought his real name was too inappropriate for the general public. So in her infinite wisdom, Janet Van Dyne dubbed him Star Fox because you're a pretty foxy guy and you've been out among the stars. The rest, as they say, is history. More importantly though, for the Eternals, Eros claims to know where Arashem took their friends and offers to help track them down in the eventual Eternal sequel or another cosmic MCU adventure. Now the question of where they were taken is a mystery, but our best guess would be the World Forge, the interstellar facility where Arashem manufactured the Celestials and the Deviants and then stores their bodies and memories in what feels like the MCU version of that robot factory from Detroit Become Human. While the World Forge is a new location in the Marvel Universe, it could actually be modeled after something from the comics, the exclusion from Eternals Volume 5, Number 1. This secret facility in Antarctica was both a resurrection chamber where Eternals could return and re-emerge after they died, and a prison for Eternals that transgressed so severely they've been deemed unsuitable for active duty. For example, two of the Eternals in prison there were Thanos' parents, Alars and Suisan, who were in trouble for siring a child that killed half the universe, which, oh snap! So with that in mind, a potential storyline for Eternals 2 could be a heist movie of sorts where these powerful godlike beings must infiltrate a cosmic prison to free their allies and potentially awaken other Eternals to the terrible truth of their situation as well. But with Eros and Pip in the picture, the possibilities are endless, especially considering that Eros became a member of the Avengers, those two are known to cross paths with Adam Warlock, and Eros even battled Ultron when he was in charge of Titan. So who knows, maybe with the Infinity Stone powered version of Ultron introduced in What If, we could see a resurgence there as well. And speaking of the Infinity Stones, they have a deep comic book connection to Eros, Pip, and Adam Warlock, so maybe we could see them form a version of the Infinity Watch, a group of people tasked by Adam Warlock with separating and guarding the Infinity Stones so they can't be used in conjunction with one another ever again. Or maybe they'll bring in the friendly Ravager version of Thanos in the main MCU timeline from What If to really throw us for a loop. But if nothing else, we'll at least get a delightfully awkward family reunion when Eros finally meets his nieces Gamora and Nebula. Speaking of complicated family legacies though, that brings us to the second post credit scene where a fretful Dane Whitman works up the courage to open a mysterious looking sword case in his office. Referenced earlier in the movie when Thena's wielding Excalibur, this is the Ebony Blade. It's a powerful magical sword forged from a meteorite by Merlin and Sir Percy of Scandia, who just so happens to be Dane Whitman's ancestor. Now, the case is inscribed with a Latin phrase, mors mihi lucrum, or death is my reward. As evidenced by these sinister whispers as Dane draws closer to the sword, the ebony blade is a cursed weapon. While it can cut through nearly any object and imbues its wielder with immortality, it also amplifies the user's darkest impulses for violence and bloodshed. Now, unlike Jon Snow, Dane Whitman clearly knows something of his family's past and the sword's power, or else he might not be so hesitant to pick it up. Thankfully, Dane isn't the only one who knows about the Ebony Blade and its abilities. As Dane is about to reach out for the sword and grab it, he's stopped by a mysterious voice off camera saying, sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? Now, as many of you likely guessed and has since been confirmed by director Chloe Zhao in an interview with Fandom, that disembodied voice is Mahershala Ali as Blade. That's right, folks, who would know better about a magical sword than a man named Blade? Now with the introduction of chaos magic in the Darkhold and WandaVision, eldritch horrors like the Dweller in Darkness and Shang-Chi, and rumors of other elder gods coming to Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, it makes sense the Daywalker would emerge from the shadows and start looking for people like Dane Whitman for help in stopping the horrors that seem about to unfold in the MCU. After all, in the comics, vampires were created thanks to the Darkhold's fell magic, and now Wanda Maximoff is speed reading it like there's no tomorrow, which, sure, no unintended consequences there. 
While Dane Whitman goes on to become the Black Knight and wield the Ebony Blade for more noble purposes than his ancestors as a member of the Avengers in the comics, for now it seems as though he'll need to work with someone like Blade to help rein in this cursed energy that permeates his family heirloom, lest it corrupt him in the process. Now one thing is for certain. With magic, monsters, and the multiverse on the horizon, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is looking wilder than ever, and I for one can't wait to see how they bring these characters to the forefront in Phase 4 and beyond. Anyway folks, there you have it. That is everything you need to know about the ending of Eternals and the film's two post credit scenes. If you want to dive deeper into these characters like Eros, Pip the Troll, the Black Knight, and other Eternals lore, we've got you covered on Nerdist.com. In the meantime though, tell us what did you think of Eternals? What do you think these post credit scenes mean for the MCU? Let us know in the comments below, and for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, stay tuned to Nerdist.com.